Okay. Um, so uh, what I'll try to do, I'll uh, try to present to you uh, a, a piece, an excerpt from um, from a manuscript. Right now, I'll try to cover five, seven big issues very quickly to make sure we have more time to, dis to discuss the document because the document is very complex, convoluted, and I do need your input. So first, let me uh, introduce to you the document, this particular manuscript, among other manuscripts and printed books, very briefly. So the, uh, the excerpt is from Sefer HaKeshek, which is uh, the most extensive manuscript of East European practical Kabbalah known to date. It's written uh, perhaps around 1739 and 1740, most likely in or around Slutsk. Um, the manuscript has more than 600 pages. It contains uh, notes from printed and unpublished sources on practical Kabbalah, magical charms uh, to cure various diseases and sicknesses, apotropaic amulets and incantations um, in different languages transcribed in, in Hebrew letters, Numerous diagrams and plates, more than uh, 60 uh, very interesting pictures. If we get to, uh, if we manage to do the trick, uh, you'll show the pic I'll show you a couple of pictures. Um, it also has an uh, explanation of healing herbs, um, dialogues with dibuks, uh, the manuscript calls them ruach or ruachra, uh, rules of exorcism, and autobiographic. Um, autobiographic insertions and observations of, of the author. Uh, this type of anthological book in the manuscript, published or unpublished, is well known among um, early modern Poles, Eastern Slavs, and uh, um, also is known in Germany and Italy. It's called Vademecum Medicum, uh, that is a digest of medical recommendations for all sorts of medical cases. Um, this particular manuscript is a little bit different, uh, how it is representative or not representative of the group of manuscripts I'm, I'm ready to talk, but it's, it's, it's a different um, and quite a big um, question. Elements of popular magic and borrowings from Kabbalah is common to both Polish and Judaic sources, and we see that in this manuscript and in other manuscripts. However, what this manuscript is, is um, uh, very, um, what makes this um, manuscript unique is that um, Hillel, the uh, alleged author of the manuscript, inserted autobiographical um, descriptions in it. Uh, they are partial, but they make uh, this manuscript uh, unique among other sources uh, written by, composed by, printed by practical Kabbalists, such as uh, Joel Balsham of Zamos or Benjamin Binush of Krotoshin. Um, these, man these manuscripts, other books by practical Kabbalists, do not contain any information on the life and um, activities of the Baal Hashem. Now, what is... We, we cannot make it work. Oh. <laughs> okay. There's another world out on the edge of the screen, and if you move it over, you can see it. Right. Uh, Show off. That's <laughs> one of the display so options. I, I, that's I, I, the magic, I, I, right? Another, another world. world. <laughs> <laughs> More like <laughs> right. Um, so, what is the place of the document which is included in the reader um, in the text? Um, the internal context of the document um, can be briefly described as follows. First, before the, this text, there is uh, a big excerpt containing. Uh, various diagrams and explanations of how amulets um, work when you need to use them to exercise the dibuks or to, to uh, attend to different cases of possession of, of uh, various degrees of seriousness. After the text, there is a very interesting and quite lengthy, extremely difficult linguistically um, excerpt um, where uh, Hillel uh, Balsham explains how he um, exercise the Dibuk in that particular case, which is in front of us. And uh, this dialogue with the Dibuk uh, contains uh, Latin words, Slavic words, and um, a number of um, interesting Latin words that I really cannot read. Thanks. <laughs> okay. Having those dialogues, who is supposed to be the audience of the, of the book? 
Uh, I, I'll, I'll talk about it in a second. Okay. So this is uh, this is the manuscript. This is how it looks like. Uh, several, it's, it's written several Heshek. The, 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 the uh, monogram out there is is a later uh, uh, edition. So this is uh, just to, to give you an idea of, of uh, what is in the manuscript, how it looks like. When I talk the diagrams, that's what I mean. Um, um, some diagrams are unique. I have never seen anything like that in the manuscript. But uh, this diagram is a direct quotation from um, um, uh, from the book published in Jolk in, in, in 1730. Um, it's it's uh, um, chiromantic um, uh, amulets uh, and, and, and the way to read the fingers and, and um, to uh, understand uh, human fates. Um, again, this is another uh, unique type of, of a diagram. I have never seen anything like that. Uh, diagrams copied from Sefer Azir Malach from other places. Um, so this is uh, this is for you just to to have an idea of what we are talking about when uh, we discuss this document. Um, so when we deal with uh, with a book, uh, there are many questions we can ask and, and ponder about the role of Baalei Shem in in um, Jewish popular culture, um, about uh, the role of magic in everyday uh, Jewish life, about the place of Baal Hashem within the Jewish society. Um, we should also take into consideration that uh, the best, the Baal Shem Tov, Israel Ben Eliezer, uh, born um, somewhere around uh, 1699, 1700, and, and died in, in uh, 1660, um, 1760, excuse me. Um, and who is known to be the, the legendary founder of uh, the movement of religious revivalism we know as Hasidism, um, started his career and became known as practical Kabbalist, um, but left uh, no traces of his um, activities as the Baal Shem. He loves Vadimekom uh this particular book, um, allows us to imagine what the Bast could have done, um, what were um, uh, cases he dealt with, what was his clientele. Why so? Because this book is uh, produced by somebody who was active in the same time, in the same area, and, and in the same, and, and was, uh, was a person uh, of the same profession. Uh, but even without the best, uh, there are other important uh, issues related to, to um, Jewish social and cultural uh, life that uh, we can um, think about reading the cases um, that the book uh, produces and reading this specific case that I have. Two words about Hillel Baal Shem. So um, as I already mentioned, um, Hillel Baal Shem is uh, the name that appears in the manuscript and this is the, the person to whom the manuscript is ascribed. Hillel Baal Shem says, I wrote this manuscript, my name is Hillel Baal Shem, and uh, if you need to know anything related to, uh, to apotropaic uh, amulets, to uh, practical Kabbalah, uh, to, to magic, to uh, how to cure possession cases, uh, you can find everything This is how he refers to his book. So in this holy book, and this uh, expression appears dozens of times in, in, in the manuscript. Yeah, please feel free to interrupt me at any given moment. Please Where go ahead. is this manuscript? Pardon? Where is it? The manuscript physically is located at the Vernadsky Library of the National Academy of Sciences of Ukraine in the Department of uh, Judaica. Uh, I can give you the number for the manuscript. Yeah. They do not have anything like that there. Just a suggestion. Just a suggestion. The diagrams you showed, not the, this one, but the one with the hand looks very similar to the clavicula salomonis in me. Right, right, right. Uh, I, I described how this book, how Hillel uses clavicula salomonis, and, 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 and he time. reads German, he reads Latin, and, and, and uh, clavicula salomonis and the books of Baal Hashem uh, belong to the same uh, realm of, of, the, of um, that is a little bit too far, but, but uh, clavicula salomonis was reprinted many times, and, and he has access to the book. Uh, this is not where he took the, the hands from. I can give you the exact book okay. where he took the, the hands from. Okay, so back to Hillel. Uh, so he was active in, in, in East Europe, um, uh, between, in, in the area between Breslitovsk, Tomaspol, Ostrog, and Rovno, mostly in Volhynia, but also in Belarusia and, and um, somewhere um, in the uh, central Poland. He could have been born um, between 1690 and in early 1700s. 
He claimed to have had direct connections with the circles of Kabbalists in Venice and Prague. He's not very eloquent when he describes that, but he says, uh, Haverai, uh, b -b -b Venice, and Prague. So, so he does mention them as, as Haverai, and it's, it's very difficult to um, uh, reconstruct what actually he means, but there are a number of, of um, references like that. So it's, it's, it's his Hevra, it's his, his uh, um, um, group of people who he is in connection with. He never reveals his real name in the manuscript or his birthday, time, and place. Uh, we do not know the name of his father and mother. We do not know anything about his family, uh, he, um, his parents. But um, he gives a detailed explanation of his itinerant life and educational pursuits. He studied medicine by uh, Dr. Abram Fortis, or Fortis, a renowned Polish doctor of Sephardic descent with Pado University diploma. Um, who served um, um, at the courts of a number of uh, magnet families in um, late uh, 17th, early 18th century Poland. Um, he also studied, Hillel, I mean, uh, also studied by Rabbi Tzvi Hirsch ben Avram, um, uh, uh, who Avraham. Uh, this is quite interestingly, I've never seen anything like that. This is a real person uh, who lived in Mezrich Podlaski. He was an Avbe dean there um, in, 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 in Mezrich. And, um, Hillel spent some time um, in uh, the house of, of this rabbi and copied Kabbalistic manuscripts uh, um, in his library. And he claims he also studied with a guy. But what actually he studied with uh, uh, Hirsch ben Abraham, um, I don't know. Uh, when I was trying to uh, track down the people who he mentions in, in the book, uh, many of them um, uh, came up to be really uh, existing uh, human beings. Fortish has uh, quite a number of articles written about him. It's, it's, it's a well-known person. Um, and he tell, Hillel tells something about Fortish that adds to uh, our understanding of, of the importance of this doctor. Tzvi Hirsch ben Avram, who Avram, exactly with the same word combination, the person appears in a number of Pinkasei Kehilot um, um, in um, in Hebrew um, documents um, um, that tell us something about the uh, religious life and religious authorities in that part of uh, Poland in the late 16th, in the late 17th, early 18th century. Hillel was married, had at least two daughters, and was seeking a stable position as a sedentary practical Kabbalist with the Jewish community. He, became, he, he began his career in the early 1730s, traveled extensively in eastern Poland, was active in the area where Israel Ben Eliezer, the Baal Shem Tov, was active. And the year when the Besht obtained a tenured position with the Medjugorje Jewish community, Hillel started his manuscript. Uh, it can be uh, a coincidence. I think it's a coincidence, but it's a quite an interesting coincidence, especially if you take into consideration that, that uh, a number of, of capitalists, including Riccanati, claim that 1740 is the year when the Mashiach is coming. So uh, the Besht gets position within the Jewish, Jewish community. Hillel Baal Shem starts the manuscript, and Mashiach doesn't come. Uh, or maybe he, he did. We miss him or her. Um, you can laugh, right? Um, <laughs> so um, Hillel mentions up to a dozen other practical Kabbalists active in the same areas at the same time, but he doesn't mention the Besht. Uh, we do not know anything about Hillel after the year 1740. Um, and um, I would just add to that that I published a number of um, half a dozen articles trying to disentangle different aspects of the manuscript. And most importantly, I have the article in, in AGSR 2004, um, Hillel Baal Shem and his Sefer HaKeshek, in which I described the manuscript and explained the importance of the manuscript for the field. Um, and um, the article um, entitled, uh, you will find it in the pharmacy, Practical Kabbalah and Natural Medicine in Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth, 1690, 1715, which I am trying to show how this manuscript relates to dozens of other books on and manuscripts on um, uh, popular medicine uh, that became very popular in Poland practically at, that, uh, at the same time, uh, after 1705, between 1705 and, and, and 1720. Now, um, methods of study. Um, I call my method uh, cultural archaeology. Uh, my method brings together elements of philological analysis and historical reconstruction. I claim that any historical document is a layered cake that contains literary elements, rhetorical layers, hidden and direct quotes from other historical sources, and so on. One needs cautiously to remove these layers one after another, as does an archaeologist, to be able to reconstruct historical events underlying the document. And I also maintain, uh, maintain that uh, one should first and foremost look for 
slips of the tongue, stylistic contradictions, and grammatical inconsistencies, and then analyze them in order to uh, reconstruct what uh, people out there call the reality. So that's why I say that my method requires a rigorous combination of philological and historical methods of analysis. Yeah, yeah please. Um, to what extent are these people writing grammatical language that you can say if it's not grammatical? In my, <coughs> case, my experience of Hebrew written in this part of the world is that it's astonishingly ungrammatical on all levels. Uh, then they know Hebrew, they can write Hebrew, but it's a very fluid and not an accurate, grammatically speaking. So I wonder how that works with your methodology. Right, thank you. Um, Linguistic analysis of the manuscript would take uh, about two hours for me to, to discuss. Um, Hillel writes in exactly in the type of Hebrew that, that you uh, uh, described. Uh, his handwriting is very much a type of a handwriting of what uh, um, other people call secondary intelligence. He writes as a butcher, as a Baal Shem, as a, um, um, as a scribe, but not as a rabbi. Um, he does use um, Talmudic expressions here and there, including the document that I'm showing today. You'll find one, at, at least one uh, direct Talmudic um, technical term. Um, so he is more or less educated. He has quotes from biblical sources. He has quotes from, from Kabbalah, uh, you know, all sorts of, of sources quotes. But most importantly, and this is what makes the, the manuscript really an interesting um, um, piece of work from the linguistic point of view, he uses many languages. When he talks to the Dibuk, to Ruach Ra, he talks in Yiddish. When he writes about his life, he writes in Hebrew. Uh, when he describes um, um, different uh, medical herbs he is using uh, for uh, different purposes, uh, he uses uh, le uh, Latin names and Slavic names of the um, of, of herbs of, of medical um, uh, recipes that he transcribes in, in Hebrew. You, when you read the manuscript, you have to ask yourself always a question, well, this is written in Otiyot, you know, in, in Hebrew letters, but what actually is the language behind the letters? You have to ask yourself oh, this question all the time. Hold on a second. Most importantly, when he comes to the incantations, so when he deals with ladies that, that um, uh, have um, uh, trouble, uh, in, you know, have trouble while they are in labor, or um, with uh, sick or possessed people, or with people who have all sorts of, of special diseases known in East Europe. He uses Slavic incantations. And when I say Slavic, I cannot tell you whether it is um, 18th century Belarusian, Ukrainian, or Polish, because it's a mixture of the languages. But definitely, he uses them also using Hebrew letters. Please, go ahead. Why is that surprising? Um, it is surprising for two reasons. Uh, we have about seven published book, uh, books by Baal Sham that appeared between 1704 and 1730 in Zhokov Press, which is the only one um, East European press active at this time, uh, after the closure of, of Lublin and Krakow uh, for um, uh, you know, about 30 years. Uh, so these books also have medical uh, remedies borrowed from uh, Latin Polish sources and uh, based on Latin or Slavic um, words, word combinations, notions, and so on and so forth. But they do not have incantations in Slavic language. This is number one. Number two, these, these books do not have Yiddish inserted in them. They do not have Yiddish as a language that the Baal Shem has to use when he attends the special cases. Um, Hillel is different uh, from this perspective. It's, yeah. So, so there uh, be a difference between the manuscript and the principal? I mean that maybe he wrote it to himself and to a very small circle of his followers or his friends. And I don't know. Yeah. Uh, let let me let me jump into your last question. Who he wrote the book for? Um, I believe um, he wrote a book um, for one specific for two specific purposes. First, he wanted to show that the manuscript written by Abel Alsham is much more important than a printed book because only the manuscript you explain first what is the remedy, how to use it, and what the Baal himself has to do in order for this remedy to work. You do not see this kind of things in the printed works of Baal Shem. 
of, of other Balishim, and he um, all the time complains that these idiots in Zhokov published these small books of the Bal of the Bal Hashem, and everybody thinks he is or she is um, a, a an expert. They grab these little books and they use these remedies without really any understanding of how to use these remedies. So one of the purposes for him to write the manuscript is to show the manuscript, not the printed book, is the real thing, number one. Number two, he uses this manuscript in order to get a position. When he comes to a new place, he goes to uh, Parnasa Chodesh, to the lay leader of the month, or to, uh, to the members of the Kahal, or to the local um, uh, Kloys they have in uh, so this territory, not only Kuti and Brody, um, um, have cloys, uh, cloys at that time, but also other towns have a cloys where they have when there are you know three four local cabalists. So he shows them uh, the manuscript, trying to explain, guys, you need somebody like me in the community because I can help you. So he uses the manuscript as we use, uh, you know, Cambridge University, Yale University, Harvard University printed book to show to the search committee that guys, please hire me. I am good. You know, I have I have a book in hand. Just was trying to say that maybe the others also use the Slavic and certainly Yiddish, but that may be something that you don't, uh, you don't print. Uh, if you print, maybe you need to use less than a quarter. Right, right, correct. Uh, but um, um, this, is a good, uh, this is a good supposition. The, the problem is that um, uh, I would like to see these manuscripts. There are quite a number of manuscripts called Sefer HaKeshek. I would say dozens of them. Um, they are anywhere between 10 and, and, and 50 pages. Um, many of them um, are in um, manuscript format, never published, and they do not have Yiddish. They have just the explanation of what the remedy is about. They do not tell you two other things. First, how to use the remedy, and two, what the Baal Shem has to do in order for this remedy to work. You will find that only in, in, in this manuscript. So there are things that make this manuscript part of the, of the pool of Kabbalistic manuscripts and printed books of the time, but also a number of features that make it unique. May I move on? Why okay. Cheshek in here, actually? Pardon? Why Cheshek? And why it comes so many times in those types of in the time um, of the separate, uh, Well, Cheshek is Cheshek, so cheshek Shlomo. It's, it's, it's the reference to, uh, uh, to biblical um, uh, ver to, a, to a biblical verse, it's also a reference uh, to uh, to a, 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 a psalm where where the word hashek has um, has a, a, a uh, you know sod meaning that is a secret meaning that that can be um, understood as as a key that opens all sorts of secret doors to uh, um, uh, to uh, human life and death. Uh, but also quite importantly, um, um, Severa Cheshek referring to Cheshek Shlomo opens up the entire um, uh, uh, huge theme of, of um, uh, Shlomo and his um, debates um, with Ashmodai, uh, Shlomo becoming perhaps uh, the first paradigmatic Baal Shem in the Jewish tradition, um, Midrashic uh, comments on, 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 on Shlomo uh, relations with Ashmodai, and Shlomo relations to the amulet, to the first Hebrew amulets, uh, never produced uh, uh, and, and perhaps not preserved, but preserved um, as references in the Russian literature. So it's it's a popular t name of of the of the books by Baal Shem um, in Europe in general, not only in in East Europe. Okay, so how to read the case which is in front of us? Uh, the excerpt from Sefer Cheshek on uh, Hillel's experience as an exorcist in Ostrog, 1733, challenges some existing theories of violence um, that we know were done by the Jews or uh, done to the Jews. David Nuremberg would not be able, from my point of view, to classify this case either as systematic violence or as um, cataclysmic violence, because it's neither systemic or systematic violence nor a cataclysmic violence case. It's, it's, it's something different. I would refer to this case as the case of ritualistic violence, uh, since it does, does use um, verbal and rhetorical forms of violence um, for direct intimidation. I'll explain how it works. Using this form of ritualistic violence based on a uh, ban of excommunication, the exorcist seeks to protect the boundaries of the communal behavior and prevent any religious traffic between the Christian, uh, in this case, Greek Orthodox, and the Jewish community. What do we learn from the case, this particular case of exorcism? 
I think this case and similar cases based on usages of excommunication for exercise purposes prove that we are dealing with a planned, pragmatic, legitimate, religious, and also spectacle violence, which in addition to that is violence rhetorical and ritualistic. The presence of ritualistic verbal violence um, complicates, um, from my viewpoint, our vision of the usages of violence by institutions of power, be that the state or the Jewish community. Now, after some deliberations and discussions, Hillel seems to be hired by the Austrian Kahal elders and most likely paid for his services. He needs to deal with an unnamed Jewish woman with a black eye, feeble condition, most likely a victim of domestic violence, regularly beaten by her lover, who was a, Christian, a Jewish convert to Christianity. She had lived with this convert uh, for several years. The guy also became a Christian Orthodox priest but as, as the Dibuk, the Ruach, uh, the spirit of this uh, guy claims um, in, the, um, in, in the part of the text that, that's, uh, that is in front of you. And um, the spirit, or perhaps the man himself, uh, facilitated the spiritual death of other Jews. Perhaps he uh, enticed them to become um, to become Christians. Had been personally involved in the death of the Jewish husband of, of um, his um, Jewish female lover, and had been supported by local priests in Ostrog. Just let me remind you that although um, the um, uh, although Ostrog and the Ostrog Jewish community are located in predominantly Catholic country, Ostrog had served for several centuries. Um, as headquarters of Christian Orthodox resistance to Catholic to the Catholic uh, expansion and colonization of um, of uh, the Ukraine, had an important Christian Orthodox academy training the priests and clergy, boasted of um, older printing of the, the oldest printing press of uh, Eastern Slavs um, in that particular area, and had certainly. Uh, uh, something very important which is mentioned or referred uh, indirectly at least twice in the manuscript. That is to say, a huge Christian Orthodox church uh, which was located right in front of the synagogue. Or the synagogue which was built uh, in front of the Christian Orthodox church. Hillel uses threats of the ban of excommunication uh, to expurgate um, uh, the memories of Christian lover uh, from the possessed, um, uh, possessed woman and cure her possession. Uh, all the information about the wrongdoings of the Dibuk Hillel obtains as part of his pronunciation of Haramot, or bans against the Dibuk, and then the woman starts talking and reveals all the secrets about uh, her relation with, uh, with this convert. Hillel uses the established forms of um, um, expression to name, but also to cover several cases of internal and external violence that happened in a stroke Jewish community. The subsequent bed of excommunication, which appears later after this document, a lengthy text, um, interrupted by the replies of the Dibuk in Yiddish, suggests that the exorcist um, is in fact directing his ban not only and not that much against the spirit, but mostly against the woman who needs to win back, uh, who he needs to win back for the community, for the Jewish community, and normal Jewish life. Uh, most importantly, he had to move the final operation outside of Strog, um, uh, to Tuchin, a um, couple of miles uh, outside uh, the town of Ostrog, where the presence of Christian Orthodox sympathizers uh, prevented him from successfully accomplishing the exorcism process in Ostrog. So he needs to move the entire operation outside Ostrog. Um, if we trust the story, uh, his method worked, and uh, he really managed to win this woman for the Jewish community, and she, so to say, recovered. Partially, but recovered. Now. What I think is uh, the most interesting part um, of the document is the double talk of the Baal Shem. So everything is named and everything is covered. So he uses a certain uh, modes of expression to uh, talk about what he's doing, uh, but at the same time, uh, there are double and triple layers on what he says. For example, when he says, I pronounce great oaths, certainly he means the ban of excommunication. When he says, evil doers surrounding my soul, he means Christians. Um, when, he ta when he talks about the place of abomination nearby, he means um, the Christian Orthodox Church. Um, when he says, you know, the Ruach dwelled in the body of the woman, most likely he talks about uh, uh, this Christian convert, this Jewish convert to Christianity who sojourned 
uh, with, um, with his uh, concubine after uh, he had uh, allegedly killed uh, her husband. So it's not a notion of a like a dimple, really. I mean, it, it's, it shows here that he enters her body and then, so the way I read it is he entered her body and then killed her husband. That is, they, were, they had a fight and she killed the husband, but then it's uh, explained through the, uh, the, the book side that he killed her, her husband. So you say that's an actual external person who then is... Let me tell you this. So far, <laughs> at, until this point, what I was discussing is something that you can ask me about, and I can explain, um, and I'll show you that I sort of know the context and understand uh, who the guy is, I understand the relation of the manuscript to other manuscripts, books to other books, uh, his place within the community of the, with, and, and in the subculture of Baal Hashem. Yuri Lotman used to say this, that uh, most philologians agree about the elements of the structure of the text. None of them would agree about how to interpret this elements, okay? So we are coming now to the point when I allow myself, um, just for the purpose of reading this particular document, some level of reductionism, something I usually do not do, right? What I'm trying to say is this. Um, we are dealing with many cases uh, with many possession cases. We know Syrupinovich case, we know the cases described by Chais in his book on, on, on the D-books and, 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 and the, the, the Ruach Ra in, in Safat. We have many cases, published and unpublished cases, of the possession. Um, we also have quite a number of these cases in Polish books. And I can show you that the uh, ways Jews deal with the D-books uh, is exactly the case Poles deals with their own cases of excommunication. With only difference is that, with, with the only difference uh, that um, in that case we deal with Baal, the Baal Shem, who is uh, not a full-time member of the of the communal hierarchy, and in, in in Polish Catholic case, in most cases we are dealing with priests who do um, uh, who deal with, with with possessions, right? So they are established uh, uh, members of the communal hierarchy. So that's, that's the social difference. Um, but if you read through the text, you will see that in many cases there is a transparent social reality behind the, the, the possession case. So there is um, a, a situation in which a woman has a relation with somebody outside the wedlock, and, and uh, in many cases, if not in all, but in many cases, we are talking about the intercommunal relationship. And uh, the priest needs to stop this kind of relations to establish the boundaries. The Baal Shem does exactly the same. So what I'm trying to say is that in many cases, but not in all, uh, uh, that we call the possession cases, we are dealing exactly with this kind of uh, intercommunal relationship, which the community doesn't want to call by its name. And the Baal Shem on the one hand, and the priest on the other hand, are inventing the language with which they can explain to themselves, to the kahal, to the community, and to the Christians that you know that, that that's you know she's possessed, she's crazy. Let's let's cure her. She, she there is there is ruach there, but excuse me, this ruach has a name, right? Oh, he has been seen with this woman for quite a number of years, right? There is physical um, reflection of their relationship, and. And they, they want to stop okay, that. So that's, I see so that the is transition my, of the internal versus the external. Correct, How you, correct. So I am allowing myself in this particular case to say there is a social reality there. Sure. I'm trying to reconstruct the social reality. The only, the only caveat here is I'm not trying to say she is entirely uh, you know, a normal person. Uh, she is healthy. And the only problem that we have with her or they had with her is that she had a relation with this uh, Jewish convert to Christianity who claims he also had become a, 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 a Christian Orthodox priest. Right? There are other, there are other things that, that, that reflect uh, the, the, the physicality of their relations. I'm, I'm saying perhaps she is also possessed. Perhaps she remembers that she had a relation with this person and she wants to reunite with him. I'm saying this because there is one problem in the text that bothers me. He is dead. Okay, he says, and then I died. The, bit, the D book from the body of this woman said, then I died. And then you came into, in, into the community of Ostrog and, and, uh, 
And I sent for you, so I, the deep book, excuse me, the half deal, mutatis mutantis, I sent for you to bring you so that you would cure me. So, but, but excuse me, who is talking? Yeah. Right? Who is talking? The woman is talking. Number, number two thing that, that we have to take into consideration, which amazes me, the deep book says, you have to take me to the mikvah. Excuse me, do they take the deep book, you know, to the mikvah, or they take the body of the woman to the mikvah? that has this, you know, coarse voice and, 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 and um, grotesque uh, imagination, all sorts of, of uh, uh, crazy things she, she poured, uh, that are poured out at her uh, when, um, when she is uh, threatened um, and, and uh, intimidated. So she, certainly there is a woman in front of him. He says, you know, I talk to the D-book, I talk to, uh, you know, I deal with the D-book and D-book answers, but he talks to a woman, excuse me, right? So that, that, that is quite clear. Go ahead first. No, that's the time, but then there is the part when the temple disclosed before the entire congregation, the heads of the community, the, the terrible, awful, and nasty things that occur in this community among the Jews, and also about the Baal Shem himself. Right. Uh, and in this case, who is the woman that she's revealing what everyone knows and no one is ready to talk about? Uh, I, I, got the, I got the question. Let, 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 me, let me very briefly um, answer you. Um, imagine the situation. They are in the central synagogue of Ostrog, which is a big synagogue. It's, it, it, it's uh, so big that it, that it, uh, it, it can host uh, uh, 700 people. Um, Ansheva Ada, that is to say, the, the heads of the, of the, of the Kahal, of, the, of the, the Jewish communal hierarchy, the top level people uh, are there in the center. Seven people with the, with the Torah scrolls are there. They have an open Torah ark. They have, pro he doesn't say that, but perhaps they have uh, candles, uh, black candles, because this is something that which is required for, for the cherem. Uh, the the, uh, the sharim, so the, the, pure, the purest people in the community are holding this free Torah. They are using uh, shofar, shofarot, they are using ram's horns, uh, and they blow the ram's horns to make sure they can uh, have an impact on, on the D-book and, and, and convince him uh, to get out of the, bo of the body of the woman. We are all, all the time talking about this, the ruach. But again, let me remind you, physically what you see is a woman in front of you. So imagine this Jewish woman beaten, feeble, with all sorts of, of uh, uh, crazy um, imaginary things. Uh, whether real or not, uh, who they are trying to, uh, to attend to, who they are trying to cure. She is extremely intimidated by all the situation. Moreover, she is threatened. They threatened by excommunicate the D-book, but again, they are talking to a woman, who, to, to a D-book who is inside the woman. So they threaten practically a woman that they will excommunicate her. And they threaten not with Kherem Araya, they, they, they threaten her with Kherem Akavua. That is to say, with, with, with complete and total bad excommunication. You are cut off from the Jewish community, and that's it. What happens at that moment? Uh, she blows up. She starts revealing all sorts of nasty things about the community. Ah, you did that, and ah, you did that. And I know that this person in the Kahal, he knew about my relation with the guy, and he didn't do anything. Um, she is also, um, uh, if we believe the D-book, the D-book is um, a, um, Eastern, a, a, a Christian Orthodox, and the D-book mentions that you cannot operate in the synagogue because around the synagogue there are my sympathizers who do not allow you to cure the woman. And who are these sympathizers? Other or Christian Orthodox priests, right? So it's a very complex situation. And in this situation, the woman actually starts confessing. And her confession about her relations, her imaginary or real relations with this D-book, um, also involve her confessions about the situation in the community. And that is something that we do see from other documents. If you uh, read how the possession cases work in Polish or, or in Sephardic world, you also see that, uh, that people who are threatened with the, bell, with the ban of communication have to say, you know, Khatati Pashati, they, they have to, 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 to say the vidui, and this vidui takes a form of, of, of a formal confession or informal confession, and during this confession, they tell you all sorts of nasty things about the community. They are trying to justify themselves, 
by denigrating the community, by saying, you know, I'm not the only one who is that bad. There are other people uh, who are also, you know, um, misbehaving around me. And that's exactly what happens. And that what I do see in other cases of, uh, of uh, in other possession cases. No, there's more, but there's more. It's an exceptionally violent case because there's more violence. I mean, as I understand it, the Dibuk has killed the husband of the woman. Right. Um, by whom she's pregnant. Right. That's right. Right. Um, so she is pregnant. Uh, and, uh, per perhaps she starts her relations with, with this uh, uh, Christian sure. Orthodox. The Christian Orthodox comes into her house, kills the husband, um, and uh, uh, starts her relation with her and lives with her for seven years. So it's quite a lengthy relation. Right. And, 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 and according to him, again, who trusts the devil? We, we, we do not have no, another no, voice no, here. No, no, so no. if we trust him, um, he was not allowed by, you know, Mimonim, uh, by, by people who are supporting him, by other Christian Orthodox, he was not allowed to kill the, the blood, to kill the fetus in, in, in the woman. So she has a daughter. Uh, equally, another, I mean, there's more death in this because, like I said, the, the Dibuk is part of this, it enters into this Christian man, or this Jewish man who converts to Christianity. Right. Um, he has lots of affairs with non-Jewish women, and then he becomes an Orthodox priest, harming Jews along the way, and then he dies. So there's another death. That, have I got that right? Right, right. absolutely correct. Um, and so, the, it, and he says he, he died of a terrible death that, that right, so, should so not be even explained. That's a non-Jewish. So what you seem to have is sort of violence within violence within violence. Right. right? You, you have this, and those are real deaths in your reading. Those are not deaths that people talk about that didn't happen. Those are actual people. Who would, the people in Austria would have known who they were. Right. Uh, plus, uh, plus, add to this uh, physical violence, because I think when he says, um, uh, when the Deep book says, or when, when Hillel says that um, the woman could not see, uh, probably with both eyes. It's, this it's is the result of physical blinded. violence at home. Uh, plus, uh, he, uh, the, the Deep book in this particular case says, I killed uh, a number of Jews you know, on the way there, right. but in that particular case, um, I don't think we're talking about real deaths, because he, he, t he doesn't say harakti et Yehudim, he says harakti um, neshamot Israel, something like that. Right. I, I can look uh, for, the, for the direct quote uh, from so, so uh, we've, we've, got, we've got real violence, and we've got spiritual spiritual, violence, spiritual ones. And we've got a real woman being Subjected to spiritual violence, so and, to, and, and, to dom, and to domestic violence, and yeah, and in the right. middle of that, is and then to cure her from all this, uh, you know, previous uh, relations, uh, Hillel uses uh, rhetor rhetorical ritual violence yeah. to intimidate her, right? And and that is the moment that allows us to unpack these boxes of violence, and that's the moment when she says, okay, there is violence within violence within violence. And, and that's the moment when everything becomes transparent, and, and as the Hebrew text says, uh, the, the, the bird, uh, you know, uh, flew through the skies, and that's, that's, that's uh, again, another, uh, another quote from, from the prophets, uh, which is usually um, mentioned when you want to say, there was a great revelation, and things that were hidden before became open. Go ahead, please. Why did, uh, this is a sort of, following your uh, reasoning, a sort of uh, rehabilitation. So her husband died, maybe murdered by the priest, who knows, and then she had this relation with the priest. He passed away, and she's blind. She needs to go on, on her life. She's not going to get any shit of him that way. So maybe if we take out the day book, and, and then she's kosher again. Um, uh, thank you for, for reminding of, of this particular you know, rehabilitation process because uh, we should pay attention at the very end of the manuscript uh, what happens to the woman. Um, and, and I apologize, I dropped one word uh, from uh, the English translation when it says uh, at the very end and she started to go to the synagogue and attend to her matters according to her needs. There is another word. She started to go to the synagogue and to the cemetery. Yeah. Right? Um, what does it mean that a woman started to go to the cemetery? First question. What does it mean 
that the text mentions that a woman started to go to the synagogue and to the cemetery. My impression is that in this kind of documents, um, if something is mentioned, it is important, and we have to interpret it. And my feeling is that the document would not say anything about a woman who started to go to the synagogue if she had been going to the synagogue before. So it is a novelty that she started to go to the synagogue. She started to see one, go to the synagogue two, going to uh, cemetery three, and attend to her needs four. Uh, attend to her needs, I think she, she started to go to the mikvah. Um, going to the synagogue and, and to, to go to the synagogue, which means that she reunited with the Jewish community. And going to the cemetery, it means that she repents, because this is where, where Jews go to talk to the nishamot of, of the, to, to the souls of, of the ancestors. And, and uh, to, to say vidui and, and to do other things. There, there are also special prayer books, uh, Man and Lashon, uh, that, that people use on the cemeteries uh, to connect to the souls of, um, of, of the ancestors. So all three things show, and I mentioned here, uh, all, th all three things show that, that she is back in the community. And the uh, mentioned here is a hidush, as a novelty, because she had not been doing that before that. So again, there is, there is a chance that, that she could have been uh, won by, by the priest who wanted her to convert after her husband. I think that uh, that is uh, the trope of blindness and the uh, rehabilitation. I mean, that's a t such a trope in the conversion, Jewish conversions to Christianity, that they are blind, or the miracles of Jewish, that, that somebody is blind, a Jewish woman is blind, and then the like host miracle happens, and right. then she gets And her eyes get open. And, uh, so this is exactly taking that trope that she was wayward, and then now she is straight again, and she regains the sight, and then she reunites with the uh, with the community and does these things proper. So I believe if you are telling me that I should not take this um, as a direct reference to reality, but as a rhetorical trope, which 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 Poles and and which Catholics and Jews share then you are reinforcing my that's, viewpoint that's right. because he is saying as these people see the see the light of the day and and and, and become christians and, and understand you know they the, the, become the, the, blind right. to the, the, and then they are she sees sees it again and she although she's damaged right she only sees but with one eye right. but she still regains the right side. she still regains her yeah. contact and her belong his sense of belonging to the jewish community that's right. yeah thank you thank you go ahead Two short points. Um, what is the Sabbatian context for this text? You mentioned there uh, after Tanoa, you wrote, oh, this is actually a nickname for the Sabbatians. Right. Um, I'm still grappling with, uh, with this issue. Um, and I had uh, a number of uh, sharp discussions with, with my mentor, uh, Art Green, who tells me do not mention any kind of Sabbatian references um, in the manuscript, but they are. In quite a number. In the article uh, that I mentioned, Hillel Balsham and Hisab Rakeshek actually tell a story of Hillel who comes to a certain community, I just don't remember which, which in particular, and, and um, they ask him, um, as an, they do not have a soifer, they ask him to look at this separate Torah. Mm -hmm. He looks at a separate Torah and finds that instead of Shem Hashem, instead of Tetragrammaton, uh, uh, they have Shats. Uh, or they have, you know, this name of abomination. And, and he has, uh, to, he convinces the community to uh, um, uh, bury the scroll and never to use it because you, you cannot erase, uh, uh, in this particular case, you can, cannot do the tikkun, you cannot correct the scroll. Exactly the same case um, I found in the article, in the book published by Elisheva Karlebach, uh, where the case of, of uh, Sabatian controversy um, is discussed in the community. And they also have a Torah scroll where uh, the uh, Sabatian minded scribe um, had, um, had the name of, of Shabtai Tzvi instead of, uh, instead of, name, uh, of, of the Tetragrammaton inscribed uh, in the scroll. So, and I put these two cases together. And I'm saying, what is the stance of Hillel Balshan? Is he anti sabbatian or pro sabbatian He is very much anti sabbatian in this particular case. But in many other cases, he says, um, I knew this particular Ish Tzanua. Ish Tzanua, in Hebrew, that is a, mo a modest person, is the word combination that Sabbatians use, crypto-Sabbatians, not Sabbatians, crypto-Sabbatians use 
to this to 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 point to, to people who belong to this you know secretive club of clandestine um, Sabetians. They say Ish Tsanua. Ish Tsanua is uh, from I would say 1690s on is a reference to uh, to um, a, a crypto Sabetian. In that particular text that I'm showing you, Hilal Balsham says, in my first case of uh, of exorcism. I had to deal with this ish tsanua, and I trembled before him. Okay, two three words. What do you make out of that? So, you know, I'm saying from what I know about the usage of the word combination ish tsanua, we are dealing with Sabatians. Right. So most of uh, of Bale Shem had an anti sabatian um, status within the community, and they were not the sympathizers. But one particular book published also in Jolkiv in 1716 um, uh, says that um, it, it's called Zevach, uh, Zevach Pesach. It's a, small, it's a short book, uh, 30 pages. So uh, the only excellent copy is um, at New York Public Library. And Zevach Pesach uh, uses not only um, uh, medical remedies um, and explains how to use uh, how to uh, deal with them, but also um, the zodiac signs and uh, the planets. And it gives two names of the planets that are usually um, mentioned in the manuscripts and in the books as two different planets. So this planet is good for this particular uh, remedies and amulets, and this planet is good for those particular uh, uh, remedies and amulets. Zevach Pesach brings these two planets that never go together together. And when I started to calculate uh, the, the gematria uh, of, of these two planets put together, um, I got um, oh, 807, right? And then I realized the planets are connected with a Vav. So I got, I got 814, which is Shatz, full respect, mm -hmm. Shabtaisi, okay? So, we are dealing with these bits of information um, referring to uh, the operating crypto Sabanians in the area. How to interpret these uh, bits of information, I don't know. But, but they are there, and I should mention them. I should name them. Okay. So I believe I'm answering your question about this. I think the point is actually about the name of the spirit that you transcribed into the Latin alphabet. If you drop the second ein, it says ein yud ein vav ein yud mem. If you drop the second ein, it could be if aim, ruach if im, and that means probably uh, a madness or possession. Right, but this is not actually the name of the dibuk. He calls uh, when when he went went after this text, he starts exercising the dibuk, and he um, uh, tells the dibuk, "Oh, you are known under this name." Um, he uses the name, hold on a second, I believe. Uh, by the way, let me, let me show you something. Do you see the, the screen? Okay. So uh, I leave it up uh, to you to read these two lines uh, for you to understand what kind of language he's using. These two lines this and that. But he says, Ihr uh, heist um, mit anderen anderen, which means mit mit ein ander, right? Salus leius cumrica. Okay, it's a good name for a dibuk, right? <laughs> uh, go, you know, be my guest. <laughs> Try to interpret the name. But this is the name that he uses, and he uses this name twice in the Herod. And he says, this is the name of the, of the D-book. Right? I tried all sorts of things. I, I did all sorts of different types of research, twisting these Latin names. If, if it is, you know, Solus, yeah. Yeah, Laius. Uh, if you can help me with that, I'll be very grateful. But uh, Salus, help, help. Something. Right, it's, it's a good, good thing to, right, Salusti, Salustius. Yeah, yeah. Solus. Can be referring to this text, right? This right. text follows uh, follows immediately the text that that, that, that I'm uh, okay. giving to you. So I, I told you that the text of the Cherem 
and the dialogue with the divok in Yiddish follows the text of uh, the possession case, uh, the, the, the story of the possession case that, that, that you have in front of you. So it, it immediately follows the text. Okay, so, so um, that's, uh, that's one of the, uh, of the, of the typical uh, issues that you have to deal with when you read this particular manuscript. You don't know in which language it is written, number one, and when you do know, or you have some idea in which language, you cannot translate it. Um, but, uh, okay, I'll leave it as is. More questions? Five minutes, Anne? Yeah. Um, so, look, uh, we have five minutes uh, to wrap up. I would not be wrapping up. I just want to ask you uh, one question. And it's my question to you, whether you think I'm reading too much in the document by reducing the possession case to a specific case of uh, religious transgression and to the necessity uh, um, of returning this woman back to the community. Am I reading too much with all my caveats, or how, how, do, you, how do you perceive that? I think it's a, it's a mix. I think we clearly have a disturbed woman here. Uh, that causes problems to the community and there are other th things involved in it. Um, and this case is, uh, it, it clearly is written as a narrative of bringing a, a, a wayward woman in, back into the community. Mm -hmm. Whether it is through interpretation of the, the, the book, whether it's an autobiography of a the book and this external person, or whether it's her own possession and her own deeds and how, and there is there are some other people involved I think it's a it's a combination it's of, a of fanta fantasy reality psych psychodrama and things like that thank you thank you okay questions yeah go ahead uh, now what if I, I would go in, in a clear direction and maybe what I would emphasize is also the fact that this woman she come back she has all of these activities in the scene of etc and she's a widow Right. Uh, she's a widow, and, and of course she's an unprotected widow. She's in a very difficult social and psychological position. Um, I'm very sympathetic with, with her case, uh, but she uh, she most likely has uh, no chance uh, to to remarry. Uh, of course, I, I I was not following her, and I have no way to follow her. Uh, but. Um, we should, we, should, we, should connect, we should connect this case to a uh, general question uh, that, that we just discussed um, um, when we're chewing out there. Chewing is not penalized, please take, take your time. Um, um, we discussed whether we have uh, the cases of possessed men. And, and um, I would say 99% of the cases that we are dealing with in Jewish literature, in manuscripts, in Kabbalah Masi, are the cases of possessed women. There is there are cases of men's insanity, but men's insanity is never called a, you know a possession case. Men is simply crazy. Men can be crazy, but to say that man has a possession that there is a possession case, I've never seen anything like that. I, I need to talk to my colleagues who, who deal with uh, um, with the sources, but but I've never seen that, and I do not think it is possible in the early modern times. Well, there's one story in the Mysore. Right. That. And I think it has been interpreted as being um, a case of homosexual behavior. That is very interesting because then you again show something that is important to discuss in the framework of prohibited sexual relations, yeah. uh, intercommunal yeah. or, or transgressive types of behavior that disrupt the normal of and, and normative way of life in the community. And then if it, it and then you can use the word combination, possession case, mm -hmm. to explain to the community why this person needs to be cured. Mm -hmm. Because if you do not use this language, the whole purpose of, 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 of haramot, the whole purpose of exorcism, right, is, is obsolete. Mm -hmm. You need to call the disease by its name to get the community involved. Then you can say, you know, oh, you have this relation, you are possessed. We'll take care of you. Don't worry. Yeah. Oh. My Quick question was, can you tell us a little bit about how common it was uh, for people to convert uh, in this time and place, and how big a danger this represented to the community, um, and, and was exorcism a common way of dealing with it? Thank you. 
Um, before I answer your question, uh, please take a look at, at the text. You saw the, the, the manuscript. Uh, now, uh, this is uh, not a very good uh, reproduction. It's, it's, it's a photo of, of, the, of the Xerox uh, that I made to work with the manuscript. So this is just the beginning of, uh, of the manuscript. And you can see here, uh, the name of the Ruach. Uh, and so on and so forth. So, so to, j just to have a feeling of what, what kind of polygraphic issues you are dealing with. Uh, so, so it's it's in addition to linguistic issues, there is also polygraphy. Now the question of of conversions, divided souls, people um, um, uh, going over the religious boundary. Um, um, comparatively speaking. Um, I would say uh, that there are very few um, cases of, uh, of conversion in, um, in Eastern Europe. At that particular time, I would say uh, the 1690s, uh, the, the, the 1740s. Um, um, even later, I would say 50 years later, if we talk about East Europe, uh, not, not uh, 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 post partition Poland, especially Central Park, uh, the number of conversions is very small. Um, uh, first, the uh, Russian Orthodox Church um, is uh, very suspicious about converts. The idea that the Russian Orthodox Church is uh, persecuting Jews with its, uh, you know, um, uh, highly positioned sword, saying convert and you'll be saved, is absolutely false. Uh, what you do see in cases of religious zeal in, in, in some Catholic countries at some time is absolutely not there in Russian <coughs> Orthodox Church. Um, and take into consideration, please, uh, this famous um, expression, very well known um, uh, to, uh, contem to the contemporary Poles, Ukrainians, Russians, and Belarusians. Zhid krishtyonny što volk prashtyonny. Meaning that a baptized Jew is as bad as a wolf who you, uh, who you pardoned. Right? So um, uh, there is this um, embedded um, negative attitude to converts. Um, converts from um, the Union Church, uh, that is a um, Eastern Orthodox Church that, that acknowledges the, the, the primordial role of the Pope, it to, to Catholicism, or from Union Church to, especially to Russian Orthodoxy, these kind of conversions are um, you know, welcomed with, with, with both hands. Uh, but not the Jewish conversions. Um, both um, Catholics, uh, uh, Eastern or uh, Russian Orthodox, or Eastern Orthodox, or Greek Orthodox, um, uh, communities and Jewish community are very much interested in establishing the boundaries and keeping the boundaries. They do not want the porosity of the communal boundary. They don't like it, right? Uh, but there are other cases, uh, other reasons to say there are very few conversions, um, and I can discuss the social implications. But it'll be it'll be a, 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 a thing in and of itself. Right. Um, I, I'm not talking about uh, mass conversions such as we have after 1757, after the uh, communist Podolsk disputation of, of Jacob Frank with, uh, uh, with, with the Jews, after which he brings, uh, according to different um, calculations, about 600 either people or families to Catholicism. That's a different case. And that's what I would call not systematic conversion, but uh, an, uh, uh, Individual cases. What does he say? S systemic and uh, um, what's the other way in your mind? Cataclysmic. It's a cataclysmic conversion. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, just, just very, very, very quick footnotes. Uh, uh, a friend of mine works in the in, in the research project that is uh, cataloging the converts in uh, early modern Poland, and from uh, uh, from the roughly the third, uh, the second quarter of 17th century until the 1780s, they have right now over three and a half thousand converts registered. Three and a half thousand yeah. in the pre-partition Poland, in the country which is yeah, seven yeah, times bigger yeah, 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 than yeah, France. Yeah, of course. Right, yeah. the country from, yeah. from the Baltic yeah. Sea to the Black yeah. Sea, and from the Sea to the It's not an exhaustive research, obviously, because they're working right. on the so certain things. How many, three thousand? Uh, over, I think it's over. Around three and a half thousand uh, converts. They have from existing 
Um, these so are Jewish, Jewish converts. converts. Yeah, Jewish, Jewish converts, converts to Christianity. Right, right. Now, now Catholicism. divided into the number of Sir? Jews. But Catholicism. Catholicism. Yeah, to yeah. 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 Catholicism. Yeah. Right. And it's mostly from uh, Bosnia, Lublin, Krakow, and uh, Vilna. They haven't done um, Ukraine. It's a big city. Right, yeah. right. Go on, please. Yeah. Um, yeah, th that's a good, very good, very good point. Yeah. Big cities, yeah. not Stadler. Right, right. I, I mean, in, in that context, have you actually tried? I've got two questions. So this is number one to do with the physicality of it. Have you tried to look? I mean, if you have a case of a woman, <laughs> yes, yes. If you have a case of a woman uh, marrying or living with a non-Jew for a period of time, acquainted with the community, he's obviously that is something that we would imagine would leave traces. A convert here and there may or may not leave traces, but uh, that kind of transgressive case, so I don't know if you've, you've looked. That's, that's one side of looking at the physicality of it, but what was striking in your reading of it is that the psychological aspects of it don't, don't seem to interest you. You have a very physical approach. She can't see because she's got a black eye because he's hit her. Freud would probably be talking about hysterical blindness, about some kind of um, emotional instability in the woman which is causing her these problems. Um, and yet you're, you're not there at all. So Absolutely not. And can you explain why you don't think that's an interesting approach to reading the text? There's a set of, of five cases of, of hysteria when Freud uh, is right, in all other cases he's wrong. It's <laughs> <laughs> very simple. But, uh, okay, and, and, and Freud, I, I don't need Freud. Freud, Freud uses, um, you know, but I don't kind of, I'm not of, interested of, in Freud so much as in the psychology of it, right. rather than the physicality of it. Well, look, I, am, I, to, I told uh, um, already a couple of times, and I replied to Manda, I do have this psychological convenience. I do acknowledge the possession case in situ. There is a possession case, right? I'm not trying to reduce everything to somatic aspects of this case, right? I'm not going entirely physical. Right. I'm not Sriaskin, excuse me, right? Mm -hmm. I'm, I, I, I do know where to stop, right? right? But, but acknowledging the complexity, I am adding the somatic aspect, and which I read socially. Right? Because I, I do read bodies socially, you know, not only physically or, or Freudian, holistically. Okay? <laughs> so um, I do agree that, that more work should be done uh, to look at the type of a case where a Jewish woman or a Jewish man lives openly or clandestinely with, 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 a, with a Christian or a convert. We do not have this kind of cases, uh, at least I haven't seen this kind of cases in the late. 17th, early 18th century private Polish towns for a very simple reason. They are very well controlled. They are very well controlled by the communities that are there. Russian Orthodox, Eastern Orthodox, Ukrainian Orthodox, um, uh, Uniat, um, uh, Catholic, Armenian, uh, Tatar, Jewish. They are in control of the community. They know what is going on. It's not London where you can have a Parnas of, of Bismarck Synagogue who is having an affair with three, Jew three non-Jewish ladies um, 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 n without being converted, uh, lives openly with, with the, with the uh, ladies from, from uh, high um, uh, London society, uh, gives 10,000 um, uh, francs to, to the, to the Bismarck synagogue in, in his will, and at the same time um, is in, on the, uh, right on the boundary between the, the two communities. It's, it's impossible in, in the private Polish town, and I believe you know that better than anybody else in the world, right? So number one. Number two, when we get to big towns, to big cities, let's say, to crown cities, when we talk about, uh, let's say, Lvov, well, kamenz right? Before 1750, uh, Vilna, uh, right? The towns that are under Polish control, uh, that have an established headquarters of, of Catholic Church, but are not in private possession of a nobleman, and uh, that have uh, anywhere uh, between uh, 7,000 and, and, and 25,000 people. It's very difficult to control this community, and I'm not an expert in that particular field. I, but even there, I have not seen uh, cases or, uh, when, when Jews would openly live with non-Jews before the 1750s. Okay, I would like to ask Magda because she would be the person to answer that particular question. Well, they could. I mean, the legal, the, there's a, this is this would be a, a very thin line be between a crime of apostasy, 
right? Exactly. And that would become part of a judicial system, and that would be a, a, a capital a, a crime. So you wouldn't have, I mean, it doesn't mean that Jews and Christians, and I found some cases in my work, uh, didn't co uh, live together or happen in some sort of marriage. But these are, these are uh, cases that are very dangerous for the right. community, and that's why they are not. They wouldn't. Uh, they would want to control. <coughs> right. Let Let me add to that. Thank you very much, Michael. Just Just one 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 gap. I'm I'm, I'm, I'm cutting off. Uh, uh, very important issue. Um, in the Russian um, penalty law, so we are talking about post partition penalty law. In the in the Russian penalty law after 1772, number one point of the Russian penalty law is apostasy, right? <coughs> and and living with a Christian openly. Uh, if you are a Jewish uh, of whatever gender, um, is is uh, is something that can be classified as that particular transgression, and it's it's the most serious, um, egregious um, uh, violation of, of the um, of the history of the law. Now, when we talk about um, sexual relations, that is a very different issue, and and we do have many cases. Um, and, but, but, but again, these people can have uh, illicit uh, sexual relations. We can trace them, we can discuss them, but it's a very different issue from the issue we have in this text when they actually live, if we trust the D-book, <coughs> seven years together. That is a scandal, and that is a communal scandal. And I believe the community could not deal with this case, particularly because the guy converted not only from Judaism to, to uh, um, uh, Greek Orthodoxy, but also from Greek Orthodoxy to, you know, um, he had an upward mobility and became a priest. How, how do you deal with a priest? Right? It's, it's still a, a very much uh, <coughs> Orthodoxy-controlled territory. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh,